Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, this is Natalie Marlowe. Um, her first novel, Eva Sally, is set in Birmingham in 1933. And it's the first in a new series from the Baskerville imprint of John Murray, who also published Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. yes. Jane Austen. And yeah, and Byron, I think. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a remarkable history. Jane Austen. Yeah. Yeah, and me. Yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on then. <laughs> um, so yeah, could you please give us a, a sort of a brief introduction to the book and its main character and that sort of thing? And, and yeah. Um, so I'm really rubbish at this because I just end up telling the whole of the story. <laughs> um, um, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, uh, like Martin said, Nika Sally is set in 1930s Birmingham. About this time of year, actually. Um, my, my next novel is really cold and wintry, but Nika Sally is a very summery novel, and I just reread some of it, and he's a very sweaty detective, my detective. <laughs> um, but yes, it's set in 1930s Birmingham, and um, my detective at the beginning of the novel only takes on divorce cases. So if you're a Philip Marlowe fan, if you're a Chandler fan, he's like the anti-Philip Marlowe because he only does divorce cases. And in those days, he needed um, uh, evidence of adultery uh, to divorce your wife. And often that meant photographic evidence of people uh, in flagrante mm -hmm. in hotel bedrooms. So it was William's job to uh, gather that evidence. He was what um, Philip Marlowe would have called a, a grubby little man hanging around in hotel <laughs> corridors. Um, unfortunately for William, or fortunately for William, he falls in love with a woman he's meant to be tailing, who's the wife of a leading industrialist and a fascist. And that uh, love affair is quite intense and life-changing for William. Uh, but it also precipitates a kind of a noirish, nightmarish, uh, situation for him uh, and he spends most of the novel trying to extricate himself from that situation. Can you see I'm trying not to give away? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so that's the basis of the novel um, and uh, trying to talk about it even more means I do give away yeah. massive plot points and my editor would be really cross if I did that so right, I don't sure. think I should do that. Are your influences the more the classic yes. old school hard boiled detective? Yes, yeah. So um, a massive reader uh, from an early age, very early age, of an inappropriate reading material. Oh yeah, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, uh, really inappropriate reading material from a very early age. And uh, we were talking about libraries earlier. My grandparents were great library users. Um, and um, I had a, a reading nana who was absolutely voracious in her reading. So she was a massive fan of uh, those lovely 80s uh, blockbuster novels, they were about that thick, yeah. uh, The Wheel of Fortune, and anything by Catherine Cookson, yeah. uh, Lace, yeah. uh, th those massive sort of 80s uh, blockbuster novels, but she was also a fan of film noir. Mm -hmm. So uh, she read a lot of Chandler, a lot of Hammer, a lot of Ross MacDonald, who wrote really large books. Um, and my, my paternal granddad, my other granddad, he was a, a real pulp guy. Mm -hmm. If it had like a bosomy blonde on the cover, he'd read right. it. Yeah. Uh, and they would pass on this, this great reading material to me. So from an early age, I was kind of, um, uh, you know, reading stuff I shouldn't, and I kind of joke that, um, well, definitely Agatha Christie was definitely my Ian Blyton, uh, and, you know, Vashel Hammett was my Roald Dahl, you know, yeah. uh, because I was reading this stuff at 9, 10, 11, yeah. and it was a, it, and I sometimes think that what you enjoy in your adolescence you know, particularly your early adolescence, kinds of it sticks, it imprints on you. So yes, I still enjoy Agatha Christie. It's still a comfort read for me. But um, what I'm most interested in, in terms of the genre I'm writing, is uh, those kind of hard-boiled, 
the text of writers of the 30s and 40s, very much so, and uh, very much North Wales. Yeah. yeah. Do you find it um, interesting to tackle it yourself because it's such a, a male-dominated, quite sort of, you know, macho, chauvinistic worldview that a lot of them yeah. put forward? Yeah, and um, I write from a woman's point of view. Yeah. And that's really very interesting. Um, uh, absolutely fascinating. I'm really interested. I, 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 in, in all honesty, I came, from, I came from an academic background when I was looking at this. So my MA thesis is on uh, Dashiell Hammett yeah. uh, and also Nietzschean imagery in Dashiell Hammett. So very masculine, ubermensch, very masculine. And um, I'm absolutely fascinated by portrayals of masculinity within the genre, but also within the genre of that period. It's a fascinating period when you're looking at portrayals of masculinity because you've got this very um, hard boiled, tough idea of what these guys were like. But when you do read the texts running through uh, these narratives, there's like a vein of vulnerability mm -hmm. and a vein of trauma um, that may have come from as an overhang from the First World War. Uh, because you know, if if you were if you were in your thirties in nineteen thirty, then you were more than likely have served during that yeah. war, which was incredibly bu uh, brutal, and a lot of young men, and would have been very formative. Uh, but also perhaps this kind of idea of um, figuring out what it is to be a man in the modern age, yeah. in, the, in the industrial age, and I was absolutely fascinated by. Um, and, and as a woman, it, it was so interesting to put myself in a man's shoes, to write from a man's point of view. Was it difficult for you? Was it difficult for me? Do you know, once I started not to overthink it, yeah. it wasn't because ultimately I came to the conclusion that um, men and women are incredibly similar. So. Uh, and, that, and and what was the only difference I felt was that is, it was William's physicality. Really much a power thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, and and from for that I kind of drew <coughs> on obviously my husband, but also um, the other men in my family. I'm, I'm from a, a boxing family. Oh. So uh, so professional boxers, heavyweight boxers, and uh, you know big guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know these big guys, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, grew up with these big tough guys, but you know, they're not that big and they're not that <laughs> tough at heart. Mm -hmm. They're just teddy bears. Right. But uh, if I was, I know for uh, all the women here will know this, I've got teenage daughters or, you know, daughters coming into their twenties now. Uh, and. I'm at home, I'm cooking a spaghetti bolognese and I don't have an onion, yeah? yeah. The co-op is 15 minutes walk from my house and my husband will drive to get the onion, even though he's had a shower and he's in his pyjamas or whatever, yeah. he's just got home from work, he will drive to get the onion rather than let my girls walk 15 minutes in the dark. Right. And that's the difference. If you're a man in the world of crime fiction, if you're a male, character in the world of crime fiction, you can, at three o'clock in the morning, walk mm -hmm. around the back alleys of Birmingham mm -hmm. and feel reasonably safe. It's particularly if you know how to, what my granddad would have said, take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, if you know how to throw a, throw a punch, yeah. and if you are physically active and physically able, that is not as a vulnerable position. But for a woman in the 1930s, that would have been such a vulnerable place to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I found that fascinating, being yeah. in that physicality of like, oh wow, I wonder what it's like to just walk anywhere, <laughs> whatever time of night it is. Yeah. I wonder what it's like. And I loved doing that. Yeah. I this, loved um, doing that. This came up on our last author visit from Anthony Lincoln because he 
he's obviously a man, but he was writing a female main character. Yeah. And um, we were talking about how, you know, if you if you meet someone off the internet, and it's like a famous thing where if you're a woman, if you're a man, your worry is that you've been catfished, that she yes, doesn't look yeah. the same. Yes. If you're a woman, your worry is that you will be murdered. Yes. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And um, I'm probably going too deep into it now, but um, you know, when you watch Marvel films with your kids and you see Scarlett Johansson just get kicked in the teeth about 25 times, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, that's not the reality, is it? And she jumps back up and starts kicking back. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, that's not the reality mm -hmm. of it. Then you see you see women who yeah. weigh about hundred pounds throwing around men who oh, weigh about yeah, two hundred yeah. pounds. And of course, <laughs> okay. yeah, that's it. So it's I was sort of fascinated by uh, the violence of my genre mm -hmm. and how that is essentially gendered. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the fact that a male violence perpetrated against women, but that, that men are, are freer because they fear it less than we do. Mm -hmm. I noticed yeah. in the book as well that every um, I don't think I'm giving anything no. away, but that every uh, woman in the book has a terrible time. Like every single woman, <laughs> <laughs> every yes. woman and girl is exploited or yeah. used yeah. in some way and yeah. subject to violence in lots of different ways, yeah. Um, yeah. which I thought was um, interesting that you don't get as much of a focus on that in yeah. books written by male crime writers. Yeah. Um, it was by stealth. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've got quite, I think I've got a reasonably big male readership for female crime writers, perhaps because I write half boiled stuff, you know, uh, but yes, I did want to, um, Nida Sally is quite gritty for that reason, mm. because I didn't want to downplay that, Yeah. you know, um, I didn't want to downplay that, and I wanted um, the women in my novel um, to be, um, oh, you know, oh, I think women are so resilient, aren't we? You know, uh, and I wanted them to, to represent that resilience, but not just the resilience of women nowadays, but the women of my grandparents and great grandparents' generation. <coughs> oh, blimey, those girls were tough, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, on a side note, I just finished, when, when I started writing the Sally, I just finished reading. Um, a, a book on the Jimmy Savile case. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, and it stuck. Yeah. yeah. It really stuck. And I think a lot of my concerns about that, right. about exploitation of young working class women. By powerful men. By powerful men. Don't have to do anyone. Absolutely. And of course, Epstein as well mm. came soon yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. close on the heels of that. And, you know, uh, and, it, and it, yeah, it was my way of addressing that, I think. Yeah. Or, or looking into that, making those women real, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think if you downplayed it, it would kind of, a lot of things set in the 30s and 40s yeah. just don't address that kind of thing. So yeah. it just feels like the setting is kind of a window dressing. Yeah. So it, it doesn't go into how people live differently. Yeah. And as it was only, you know, there were people still alive who were around in the 30s, so, yeah. you know, it's worth not crossing over it because it's people's experiences oh, still like there's yeah. some of these grandma out there who went through that and had all these horrible things happen to her. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think it's, a, it's yeah. brilliant that you go into that because to just have it be as a lot of especially gangster things, um, they they're so preoccupied with making the men look cool and the women look sexy mm -hmm. that they don't go into anything to do with the actual living conditions. It's just yes. like a it's a to an aesthetic rather than a, yeah. a setting. Yeah, but of course, um, oh gosh, uh, but these people were real people. So um, I'm not giving them anything away because it's actually in the press release, the big press release, but um, the character called Queenie in the book was based on my great grandma. And she was one of 13 children and she was born in Aldbury. Mm -hmm. And she was, um, born on a canal barge. So her family hauled coal mm -hmm. into Birmingham and out into the coal fields and back again. That was that was her early life. But she married my great granddad just after the um, First World War and he uh, ran 
Uh, who's a bookies runner? If you know what a bookies runner is. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, do you know what a bookies no. runner is? <laughs> so gambling was illegal. Oh, okay. So effectively, he was an illegal bookie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so effectively, he might place bets on on, on racetracks and things on behalf yeah. of this community. Oh, but effectively, it was illegal bookmaking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and other things, other criminal activities in 1920s, 30s Midlands. Yeah. <laughs> but and, and he died young uh, because he was gassed during World War One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he died young, and uh, my great grandma took over that business. Oh, <laughs> I am not kidding you. She really did. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember her, well, I don't remember her because um, I was a baby when she died, but there's lots of stories about her in the family told by my grandmother, who was her daughter in law, um, the wife of the heavyweight boxer, my granddad. You can see how boxing, criminality. Yeah. You know the, the Midlands urban environment, uh, and I was the, the stories I heard about her were of that kind of working class nana. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you were ever in trouble, you go to Pam and then to Pam. Oh, she was brilliant. She'd sort anything out. She'd sort anybody out. Mm. Oh, she made great gravy. Everybody remembers her Sunday dinners and all of that. Uh, one of those working class women who was absolutely spotless. You yeah. know, <laughs> prided herself on the the absolute spotlessness of her neck curtains and stuff. And it wasn't until, because it was a little bit of a, a family skeleton, I suppose, mm -hmm. it wasn't until I was in my teens I actually knew the reality of the situation. And she'd been in prison twice. Oh. You know. Um, so, oftentimes when I think about criminality, I think about working class people in those days falling into a way of life mm. that kind of sustained them. Mm. Uh, you know, that it was a way of earning money. Yeah, if you, if you lost your job then, yeah. you were in a lot more trouble than and, if you lost your job now. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think they were buying massive houses and things. I know that they owned a whole street of terrace houses. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but there wasn't particularly an awful lot of wealth or whatever, but it was just a way that they sustained themselves. I'm not excusing their criminality in any way. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to think where it came from. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking those really extreme circumstances of the early 20th century when, you know, if your child has TB, can you afford the, the doctor? Right. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, what would you do if your child had tuberculosis and no NHS, needed, no NHS, yeah. and you needed to pay for that doctor. I'm pretty sure that I would go to extreme measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and I was trying to sort of empathise with that. Yeah. I suppose it must help you to humanise that sort of. Yeah, humanise, empathise. When, when, you know, yeah. I'm very interested in people. I think most writers are. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to make my people real. You know, and I drew I drew on that history. So were you able to take stories about your family and sort of weave them in and uh, sneakily? Sneakily. Is there anything in there? Uh, there's a, not really, no. <laughs> They're just, it's just like the voice. Yeah. So that, mm -hmm. um, so Queenie's voice is, oh my goodness, I channeled it. I wasn't planning to write that character. Mm -hmm. Oh really? Just she up. just appeared, I kind of, it was like a, I might as well have been having some kind of seance. Mm -hmm. She just <laughs> appeared and and it, her voice is, is my grandmother's mm -hmm. voice. That kind of yeah. sharp, you know, do as you're told, yeah. behave yourself, say it like it is. Yeah, yeah that was her voice, her voice, yeah. Nice. Um, how do you feel about the, the, the Peaky Blinders kind of, that glamorizes it, if you like. No. Um, you know, it's very complicated because it, <laughs> it, it does humanise them in a way. It does have the it has oh, the post-war trauma, yeah. um, but also makes them look incredibly cool to the point that they right. get tattoos yeah. of them on their arms. Yeah. And, you know, um, so I watched the first series. Yeah. Got to bear in mind, I started writing Needless Sally in 2016. Yeah. Um, so I watched the first series and just thought, oh crikey, I don't think I can read. I can watch any more of this. But my mum. Yeah. Watched it all. My mum and dad watched it all. They're <laughs> massive fans. 
and my mum was like, it's like family history, it's like family <laughs> history. And I was like, mum, hey, we were never that good looking. <laughs> we were never that clever and we were never that cool. Yeah. I can pretty much guarantee we were never <laughs> those things. Um, uh, but it put Birmingham on the map a bit, didn't it? Yeah, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, who doesn't like Killian Murphy on the horse and Nick mm -hmm. Cave? Yeah. Red right hand. It's just so stylish. Yeah. I don't think Nida Sally's anyway near as stylish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not a stylish sort of novel. It's, it feels more grounded and gritty and it's, 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 it's painful. Yes, yeah. because uh, um, there's an American called Gary Trevisi who's a uh, writer on hard-boiled. And he believes hard-boiled, American hard-boiled fiction is social realism. Okay. Chandler says the hard-boiled guys brought crime back to the streets, back where it belonged. How you know, crime, yeah. crime does not, as much as I am a fan of golden age 1930s crime fiction of right. the UK, crime does not belong in the drawing rooms of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it belongs on the mean, what he calls the mean streets. Yeah. And, and Dashiell Hammett was the first to do that. He brought crime back, back onto the streets and he gave it that kind of realistic dialogue. So that hard boiled mean streets dialogue, yeah. very yeah. sharp. That when we when we think of that, we think of that in terms of a kind of a kind of nineteen forties film noir pastiche of what a book by dialogue is. But when you actually read the dialogue these guys wrote, it's it's socially realistic working class dialogue. Right. And even though I'm n I'm not from Hammett's San Francisco, if only, yeah. uh, I recognise those speech patterns. Mm -hmm. So so John Le Carre, great spy writer. Yeah said um, in a very early Smiley novel that the um, the way those guys at the circus spoke, yeah. the spies at the circus, the posh boys at the spoke at the circus spoke, was like a fan dance. <laughs> like, uh, they were just unveiling little yeah. bits of meaning, yeah? And then in a later uh, Smiley novel, Spy came in from the cold. Alex, Alec Lima says, um, I do not communicate that way. He says it to control. But he's kind of doing that you know, when they talk in spy um, novels, when you think, actually, I'm not quite sure what they're trying to say here. Yeah. It's, yeah. They're, they're kind of talking around the subject. Mm -hmm. Well, Alec Lemus went, I do not communicate in that way for control, and the control had to say. And I think working class people are more direct. Mm -hmm. They're more, uh, uh, I think, very creative in, uh, and I hate that word, banter, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's it's almost like poetry, yeah. the way working class people convey meaning to one another, yeah. uh, and I absolutely love it. I love that. It's a good love way to swear words. Absolutely. Yeah. It communicates a lot. It does. It does. And 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 for me, that's the kind of when I was writing that, it took me right back to my childhood. And it was like a little tart. It's like a tardis, mm -hmm. thinking about the way uh, those people. Talked. And you know, I'm from a big working class family, so I still do talk. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's social realism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I love that. <clears throat> they all have this sort of grim, horrible worldview. You don't really modern stuff. When you have detectives in modern stuff, they 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 always invent some tragedy for them. Their wife has always died, pretty much. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so they're missing that kind of social element of. <clears throat> These fellas have all come back from the war, and every single mm. one of them has got undiagnosed PTSD. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So they have to invent something like their wife is dead, or they're divorced, or they're an alcoholic for some reason. Yeah. Um, so it always feels a little more. Yeah. Perhaps that's why I write historical stuff, yeah. you know, because it's there for me. It's there for me to mine, you know, these yeah. tragedies and traumas and resilience, human resilience. Yeah. Yeah, human resilience. Um, did you have to do a lot of research in terms of the, the place? Um, because it comes across really well in, in the book, um, to the point where my wife is from Birmingham and she would run in every time she'd spot a place that she loved and she's like, oh, she's writing about the tea rooms at the art gallery. I have to take her. Yeah, lovely. Um, there's a part where um, you, you talk about, I think it's the, the fellow who owns Battersea Clinton, 
Um, oh, so you, you do. some people we're spot big, that and some people don't. We're massive yes. national trust yes. fans. Um, yes, that's my wife's favourite national trust place in the country. Oh, uh, you and that, um, you, so yeah. She's, she spotted that on. and she was like, "Oh my god, yes. she's really well Madison Clinton." Yes, um, in like a, a quite an obscure way where it's like the the, the story of just insane. Yeah, the story yeah. of the man because it was the murder of Madison Clinton, oh. um, which is brilliant. I think you can still see the blood stain on it. Yeah. You can, um, yeah, which yeah. Is brilliant. Highly recommended National <laughs> Trust to come to it. It's got a moat. It's amazing. It's, um, yeah, it's an amazing place. So did you, so did a lot of it come from pre-existing passion for the places that yes. you write about? Yeah. Um, it must um, be hard because um, a lot of Birmingham was, was blown to bits in was. World War II, wasn't yes. it? So yeah. it's a lot of it not well, totally there anymore. Gosh, that's the pleasure for me. I could research a book. Yeah. Give me 10 years and I'll thoroughly research that book for you. It's such a pleasure. Um, a lot of the stuff I knew already because I'm a, I'm, I like to walk mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I'm a big canal girl. Mm -hmm. You know, I love, I love the canals. So um, a lot of the stuff I kind of knew, I, I, I kind of knew where he was, if that yeah. makes sense. And then um, I started to research, I was on the um, National Newspaper Archive a lot, mm -hmm. and um, just looking at what was going on in Birmingham in 1933, yeah. um, but the best resource really were the advertisements. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, little cafes, <coughs> uh, hairdressers, pubs, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also uh, what was advertised in terms of uh, convenience foods and right. oh. yeah, oh, okay. so uh, obviously with birds custard it is and Thai free tea, uh, but grill cream was a Birmingham product as well. Oh really? Yeah. So I mean these things were just absolutely fascinating and I'd fall down one rabbit hole and then another rabbit hole and I would say that 95% of the stuff I've researched is not in the book. Oh, right. Uh, but um, it, it was just um, an absolute pleasure to get into that. There's also lots of lovely BFI films on YouTube of, of Birmingham and the whole of the Midlands oh, right. from the 30s. Yeah. Uh, particularly when Birmingham was trying to sell itself oh. as um, uh, a maker of cars, etc., etc., yeah. and you know, bikes and the all factory of, the factory for Yeah, that's it. A, a ten, was it a thousand trades or something? Mm -hmm. Ten thousand trades. Mm -hmm. So it was trying to sell itself, and, and those were fantastic uh, resources because I could <coughs> see the traffic and how that worked on New Street. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. I could also see what people were wearing. Yeah. But um, thirties fashion, that's that's a kind of pet love of mine oh, yeah. uh, and I'm a massive film fan a huge film nerd so 30s fashion and things like that I'm absolutely I like yeah. you know I can nerd out on that stuff uh, but are you watching lots of films from like Hollywood made films from the yes. 30s or are you watching films that were sort of set there um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of something called pre-code Oh, right. Yeah. Before all of the Hollywood rules of, yeah, we can't wear that. That's it. So, those lovely uh, violent gangster films from the early so 30s. Scarface, I think. Scarface, yeah. But also, Busby Berkeley musicals. So, there's a, 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 a film star called Dick Powell that William has dreams about in my novel. And he was the first screen Philip Marlowe. But before that, he was like a crooner in the 1930s. He had a beautiful high tenor voice. And he was in, in things like Gold Diggers of 1933 and stuff, playing the young romantic hero. Oh, and when he hit his 40s, he wanted to change. And he became a 40s film noir tough guy. Uh, and I was like, I'm obsessed with Dick Powell. I'm obsessed yeah. with Dick Powell. Um, so he, so uh, I don't know what came over me, but my detective has vaguely erotic dreams about him. <laughs> oh, <fantastic>. um, <laughs> <laughs> so I get such a lot of information from my love of film, yeah. um, including the, the, the slightly weird elements of the novel. <laughs> That's That's yeah. I love. I saw you did a, a post, um, which was like a, a walking tour of Birmingham with all of the places from the novel in. Yes. Which is brilliant. Yeah, um, and I'm gonna. I don't think I'm giving too much away, but I'm gonna. I'll be at the Birmingham Literary Festival doing something very brilliant. similar. So oh, yeah. Stuff. So that'll be, that's, I'm really looking forward to that, that'll be a lot of fun. Now, yeah. What made you pick Neva Sally particularly? 
I'd love to say, uh, yeah, I've been obsessed with Beavis Alley and it's history in its name for the past 30 years, but that's an absolute lie. <laughs> I was halfway through the novel and I knew that William had an office in central Birmingham, probably Cannon Street. Uh, and I was with my girls in the Starbucks opposite the Tesco Express. <laughs> <laughs> my wife was reading the book and, and you were talking about where his office was and she was like, that's by the Starbies. Yeah, did it? Oh, yeah. Did say? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um, and I, I was looking out of the window and I said to my, I think it was, I think I had both of them there and I said, I said to Frey, I said, ooh, do you think Nidra Sally is a good title for a book? <laughs> She went, oh, yes, yeah. yes, Mum, do it. So he kind of, he went from Cannon Street to Nita Sally because such a great yeah. name for a book. And Nita Sally has a fan, does have a fantastic history. Once I put him there, oh, boy, I found out some research rabbit holes about Nita Sally, amazing. So what is, tell me about it, because when I said to my husband, who I said from Hales Road, and I said, so it's called Nita, Nita Sally, and he said, oh, so it's set in Birmingham. So yes. he knew, even oh, though yeah. he's not from San Francisco, yeah. So why, why, what would he know? Why would he know it? Oh, okay. Uh, so there's, there's lots of theories about why it's called Nita Sally. Mm -hmm. The first one is, is to do with like Birmingham's metal trades. Mm -hmm. It's probably Needles Alley, oh. and they made needles there. It's also one of the oldest streets in Birmingham. Yeah. It, it's more than likely um, early medieval, early medieval in day. Yeah. Uh, but another reason why they think it's called Nidra Sally is because it has a reputation for being really seedy. Right. So in the early Victorian period, in the late Georgian period, it was the place where all the women of the night hung out. Mm -hmm. um, I did write a little bit um, the Times, which makes me sound very grand, but I'm not at all, <laughs> about um, a place called the Grand Sultan Divan. Mm -hmm. And that was, set, that was in Nidra Sally, and it was effectively, it was a coffee shop, uh, Dancing hall, Victorian mm -hmm. dancing hall, come knocking shop mm -hmm. there, and there was a massive robbery there. Um, the guy who owned it married a um, a brothel keeper from Liverpool, and she came to the marriage with like thirty thousand pounds, which is not a lot of money, hard earned money. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the marriage was going sour, and she wanted her money back. She wanted to leave him, but he wouldn't let her have her money back because of. You know, the married oh, rules, it was his money. Yeah. So um, she basically drugged his brandy, robbed his safe, and ran off with her fancy man. <laughs> um, and it was a massive scandal. It wasn't just in Birmingham a scandal, it was like in all of the national oh, newspapers. Right. And uh, the upshot is the fancy man got arrested for theft, but uh, the wife didn't because, she, because of the marital laws, the strange marital laws. You technically can't steal from your husband. Oh, oh really? So, done it. Oh, I know. When I read that, I wrote this was originally in Nida Sally. William was telling you this story about Nida Sally and its seedy reputation, and I had to cut it because it was just so, it was just too much backstory. But it's I've been like, oh boy, I'd love to write that story of the Grand Sultan to and what went on. Yeah. yeah. Because it, but that, but so he had this beautiful seedy reputation, and. The punchline to it is, when he sold up, he, he was bankrupted, the guy who owned it. When he sold up, he sold up to the YMCA. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so it became the YMCA building in Birmingham for a very long time. Yeah. Whereabouts is it? Do you know? I don't know. I've been trying to find it. But it would have been absolutely massive. It was a really big building. But so no, Nida Sally. Sally. Oh, Nida Sally. If you go up New Street towards the museum, towards uh, the yeah. Beamer, it's on the right-hand side. And it takes you up to Temple Row and the church and the and the cathedral. Okay. Yeah. My yeah. wife was reading the book and, and um, William was leaving um, his office and she was like, "It's going a weird way." <laughs> yes. And she was just like, "Oh, it's because it's because he wants to have a look at all the fancy things." And so, of course, well, it's because Natalie wanted to take him on a little journey. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. That was one of those moments where she ran into the kitchen and was like, "Look." Yeah. yeah, I know where this is. Yeah, I do that a lot. I take him on very odd routes. Yeah. Because, you know, because I fall in love with places and I yeah. want to write about them. Yeah. Um, so have you got lots of uh, other places you want to squeeze into the second book? Yes. Know? So the second book is actually a little bit different in the sense that it's, it, it's only in one place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's more claustrophobic than Nida Sully because oh, he doesn't... Yeah, yeah his... his uh, 
he, he ends up um, in a country house environment. Oh, okay. Oh. I'm not going to say bad to sleep in. So. <laughs> but he ends up in a country house environment, um, stranded with Phil. Yeah. Um, investigating um, um, an intruder uh, in this country house. So the country house is actually being used as a treatment centre for men with PTSD oh, and yeah. alcoholic disorders. Yeah. Um, and that's based on a real place I know. Um, and he's, he, he becomes stranded there in a flood and uh, all manner of dark <laughs> shenanigans go <laughs> on. <laughs> but it's, it's very much centred in that place, in the one place. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in the third one, I'm, I'm, back, I'm back in Birmingham. Yeah. How many do you have planned out? Well, my trouble is there's never thinking of stories, it's thinking which one's the right story. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you sort of come up with, um, like the, the, the first one, did you come up with the idea to write something in Birmingham first, or did you come up, was it sort of genre first, or setting first? Oh gosh, first, that's or? really interesting. Because you obviously, you obviously love the genre think. as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm, upset, I'm, upset, I'm obsessed with the genre. The genre is my genre, it's my reading genre, I'm a reader rather than a writer. Yeah. I really am. Um, oh, what did did I come up with the setting first? Do you know I don't think I did. For for a while, I toyed with Coventry. Don't tell anybody from Birmingham. You can edit <laughs> this out. Uh, for a while, I toyed I toyed with Coventry because I loved the whole idea of Coventry as this beautiful medieval city mm -hmm. in the 1930s. No offence, Coventry, uh, but it, it this beautiful medieval city, you know, the jewel in Warwickshire's crown. It was called. Um, and that was bombed yeah. to heck as well. Yeah, bombed, bombed to pieces. I've seen interviews with um, Lee Child is from Coventry. Yes, and he said just, yes. Just rubble. He just grew up in rubble. Rubble, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I did toy with Coventry, but then I thought, no, I needed somewhere there a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. I needed a bigger... Because when you write noir, you need to have that, that kind of high-low dynamic. Right. You need to have... You need to be able to to be in the kind of the back streets and the alleyways, but then you need to really think about how the, the higher echelons, uh, uh, this makes me sound like, um, uh, this makes me sound very modern, but this is, this is what Chandler said, this is what Hammett said, the, 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 these levels of exploitation with the sort of the higher ups, that's what noir is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what is it's questioning what's crime and who's the bigger criminal. Right. The, 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 the gangster beating up the bloke who didn't pay his bookies fees, or the mine owner who lets 45 men burn to death mm -hmm. yeah. because it's easier than trying to rescue them. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and these, are, these are not my ideas. These, this is what Hammett was doing. And this yeah. is what Chandler said in *The Simple Art of Murder*, which is his massive essay on how to write crime fiction. Oh, you know. that, oh yeah. boy, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's brilliant, and informative, and, yeah. and, and, and such a Raymond girl. Yeah. Love Raymond Chandler, uh, but yeah. So, so when you write noir, you're really thinking about these high-low dynamics, mm -hmm. and, and I think you need a big city for that. Yeah. And Birmingham is. Perfect, perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. It's got the same sort of quality as like a New York or somewhere. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Chicago. Right. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, it is Birmingham, but Britain's Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you find um, the, the pressure to get things? Did you find there was much pressure on yourself to get things accurate and historically spot on? Because I imagine there's a bit of a bit of a tension between wanting to be entertaining and yeah. get to get to the meat of the story quick and wanting to yeah. put in loads of backstory yeah. as you were saying yeah. um, because it's interesting and, and yeah. this is your chance you're talking about it yeah. you're there why don't you just put all the yes. backstory in oh yeah so. I, yeah with in terms of backstory and what I've learned I had to really rein my neck in yeah is that something you had yeah. to go up with a red pen a few times yes yeah and um yeah, and I, I work in a really awful way, and so my writing process is, don't try this at home, it's yeah. awful. Yeah. Uh, but it meant that I had to kill an awful lot of darlings, mm -hmm. an awful lot, just beat them to death with a claw hammer, <laughs> really, really murder them. Mm -hmm. And it was painful to do that, but it made for an easier read. You know, the, you have to write for pleasure, 
but then you have to edit knowing that you have to edit for your reader's pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I really had to do. Yeah. Um, in terms of accuracy, I'm such a nerd that accuracy <laughs> is like... And also my husband's a nerd, so uh, throughout the text I was calling uh, William Webley a gun, and mm -hmm. Andrew's like, uh, uh, actually, I think you'll find it's a sidearm, a revolver, or a pistol. Does <laughs> <laughs> awesome. it speak like that? Honestly, oh God, don't watch this, Andy. Leave <laughs> that out. Um, uh, but yeah, but so my husband was like giving me all of this, like you know, uh, he's a big. Uh, he's like, oh, Doctor Watson has a Webley, I think. Um, so you know, um, and they, the guys in the First World War, they wouldn't have had Webleys. It was a, it was army issue. Uh, and he told me all about that, so he was like yeah. reading for these details oh, as well. Right. I've, read, um, I've read about that stuff before because I've um, written stuff that's set in World War Two and that sort of thing. I'm like, do they call it a weapon or a yes, rifle? Yes, I gun? know. It's yeah, hard, and that's stuff you don't really think about until you put the word in and you're like, yeah. ah, I don't know the yeah. answer to this one. I'll tell you what I think I did do that was that was perhaps modern, and that was for swearing. Mm. Ah. The effing and Jeffy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, sw I swore because I'm not a big swearer myself, but um, it felt realistic to the character. And I was remembering the first time I heard my dad say the F word, and I swear I was in my mid 20s. Mm. Like, I just, I, I, was, I was actually in his workshop. He's an upholsterer, trimmer of bitter. So I was scrounging fabric because I'm a sewer as well. And I was on the scrounge for fabric, and he was effing and jeffing at all of the blokes he was working with. And I was like, oh! And the bloke said, hey, up, hey, up, chill, chill, chill. Yeah. Um, because I was a woman in the workshop. Right. Uh, and I think, I'm not too sure I ever heard my grandfather say the F word. He would have said bloody hell and things yeah. in front of women. So it was like a little, a little yeah. like, a cut off, like, you know, yeah. you know I think basically he wouldn't, in front of men, definitely. Mm. Yeah. But uh, not in front of women. And I don't think I got that quite right. Mm. Uh, I know, and when I was doing it, I thought that's not quite right, Natalie. But I did yeah. it anyway because it was seemed right for the character. Yeah. yeah. So it was a massive compromise between the modern readership and yeah. what what perhaps would have been absolutely accurate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've not talked about that before, but that niggles me a little bit that mm -hmm. I did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did not notice at all. I wasn't sitting there going... Perhaps, yeah, well, perhaps it's because um, I'm not much of a swearer. The swearing really jumped out at me. Yeah. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you deal with a lot of very grim uh, topics in the book. Yeah, I think I did. As grim as yeah. you can get, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you have to, um, when you were publishing, sending it to the publisher, did, did you have to do anything along the lines of tread carefully around certain things, or...? Not in a, you know, not in a like, you can't say this, that, and the other, but in a, this is a sensitive topic. Yes, kind of okay, topic. I do um, get that. How do you approach that sort of thing? Because uh, it's, it's just, I've never done it myself, yeah. um, written about that sort of thing, but it's, it seems like yeah. there would be a, an extra pressure on you. No, it was, um, no, there wasn't. It, in absolute honesty, because, um, my uh, editor is a specialist crime editor. Oh, okay. So, so it was water off the duck's back. <laughs> uh, so I was, I sort of said to her, um, you know, I look like I'm a member of the WI, but I'm writing really hard stuff, mm. you know. Uh, and um, I get a lot of jokes like, oh, it's always the quiet ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, but she was like, no, no problem, no problem, absolutely no problem whatsoever. Um, there's a, have you ever heard of a writer called Derek Brayman? He's a Brit oh, noir writer so. from the 1980s. Yeah. My stuff is nothing like Derek Brayman's. Mm. You know, uh, I'm gritty, but love no, neck. Above and beyond. Above and behind. No. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so noir readers tend to be more um, accommodating. Right. Uh, and. I, when I've included the grittier stuff, it's never to be salacious. Yeah. Right. This is not, you know, me being salacious. I've seen that in films a lot where they have things where they, it drives me crazy, where they use sexual assault as like a character yeah. building scene. Yeah. Things not like Noah the Dragon Tattoo and that sort of oh. thing. Um, yeah. it's just I don't want to talk about how, uh, how yeah. I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I really don't. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you, you feel it in your book, which is yeah. different. Like it doesn't feel like. Uh, These yeah. are the realities. You know, those men were traumatized by war, but what were their women traumatized by? Right. Mm. Uh, and those are the realities of that life, you know. Mm. And, and women's lives now. You know, you reach a certain age where, you know, how, you know, you, you sit in a room with a bunch of women, oh yeah, that happened to me. You get to a certain age where, oh, you know, this is normal. Yeah. Not as extreme as what's going on in New Salem. But I th- oh, actually, I'm going to come out and say that what's in Nevis Alley is nowhere near as bad as what's going on right now, probably in Redditch. Mm. I pull back from all sorts of things I could have said and shown, because mm-hmm. uh, it, it's gritty enough. Because you know, you know, it's gritty enough as it is. Mm-hmm. But the reality of a lot of people's situations, young women's situations, mm. is far more. Um, exploitative and sad and traumatising than I could write. What crime does, I think, P.D. James said that crime gives readers justice yeah. and order in a world that doesn't seem very just or ordered. Um, and, 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 and that's what I've tried to do in Nevis Alley, even though it's gritty and a bit yeah. full on. I've tried for there to be a sense of justice there and order even though it's a, it's a kind of what happens is chaotic and traumatic. Yeah, no, that totally came across as well. I'm a big horror fiend and I, oh, I love uh, slasher films okay. to my shame. Um, but a lot of the, the writing around slasher films is the same kind of thing of, um, you know, you've got a maniac, always a man, running around, killing everyone, and then it's terrifying, and then at the end you get this closure where that person is killed off. Um, mm. But obviously slasher, slasher films are a lot more uh, troublesome because they like revel in the murder and, yeah. and bring the bring the bad guy back to murder more people for another ten Yeah, films. and so it's a very I, mean, it's a th- I mean, if you're really into genre, you know, noir and horror, if you're really into this stuff, um, there has to be a reason why we enjoy it. Mm. Because it has to be enjoyable. I mean, the part of, part of crime writing is solving the mystery. But I think it's more to do... Well, this is from my reading rather than my writing. For me, it's about the journey these characters have in extreme circumstances. Mm-hmm. And of course, slasher uh, films are like that. This is an extreme circumstance that yeah. these characters are under. And it's kind of thrilling to watch that journey. Yeah. But of course, you have to temper that. Well, for, for me, I have to temper that with, with realism. Yeah, that's one of the things that I find um, being a horror fan and, and is um, you always have to kind of like it's okay to love a thing and admit that it's also horrible and does horrible things and there are examples of it that are terrible and shouldn't be made and uh, you know things like there's no reason anybody should be making Cannibal Holocaust anymore um, <laughs> so you can watch it and, and appreciate what it was doing but yeah. at the same time saying this is terrible you should not have done this yeah. um, like there are you I think however much you love a particular thing especially a genre in entertainment um, it's healthy to be upfront about yes, yes. There's, there's lots of problems yes. in this as well. Yeah, yeah, not, you're, you're dead right. Well, yeah, a lot of um, uh, horror academics, especially, defend horror to the death, mm. and, and they're like, you know, looking for all the positive things that horror does and, yeah. and refusing it, all of the negatives. Um, and it's very easy to, when you love something, jump to its defense and just yeah. be like. Yes, I know 20 mur- murders of women were in this film, but mm. it's really feminist because she kills them at the end. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. you just sat through and watched 20 women be murdered yeah. to get to that bit, so. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> I mean, these things are so, I think these are things that are really complex, aren't they? When we step, mm. when we step back from the things that we love and really think hard about what's going on there. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think it should stop us loving them because I think there's enough in, yeah. I mean, because I think there's enough healthy analysis when we, when we kind of watch, um, a, a, you know, a terrible horror film or uh, we're reading a particularly violent crime novel. Mm. There's, you know, we're, we're intelligent people, aren't we? Mm. And we can we can step back from that and kind yeah. of analyze. Yeah. But but then they, then you, but then you've got fans who will always defend. Yeah. 
you know, their particular favourite writer right, or that filmmaker. One of the things I loved about your book is, is that it, has, it gets the pain of the characters across really well in a way that a lot of um, murder mysteries don't. Um, yeah. It gets across the kind of the, the torment they go through. Yeah. And one of the reasons why the murder doesn't happen until about 30,000 words in is because I wanted to give the victim, uh, for the victim to be a natural person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You should have seen my wife's face when she got to that bit. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I was, just, <laughs> I was watching her read it. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted her to be a person and I wanted uh, my readers to feel for her and understand her and then feel for the people who've lost her grief. I wanted mm. that to feel real. I didn't want her just to be um, a plot device. Yeah, it's very I didn't rare. want my dead woman to be a plot device. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very rare in... in um, especially films, when you feel something for a victim, especially in a murder mystery, because quite often they're, they're dead within five minutes. Mm. And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I thought that, that came across really well. Thank you, thanks. Um, I've got this thing about um, how in novels often it's almost pornographic the violence against yeah. women. Mm. I, I mean, I read one Joe Nesbitt for The yeah. Snowman, I couldn't read any more, mm-hmm. you know, it was almost there for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's really, really important. Um, gosh, if Nita Sally is about anything, it's about violence against women, mm-hmm. in all its forms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I don't shy away from it. So there's pornography, there's actual pornographic scenes in in Nita Sally, because Mm -hmm. that's part of women's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Women serve that industry, and men consume that industry without thought. And I wanted wanted people to question that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I wanted to question how that industry feeds into further exploitations of women. Uh, I wanted to think about what female trafficking actually is. You know, what is female trafficking and how female uh, trafficking of women and girls affects women who haven't been trafficked who haven't been exploited in that way because those because this is our culture our mm-hmm. culture tacitly allows this because it's going on as much as we can uh, get upset about Epstein and Savile it exists right now mm-hmm. it's been industrialized hasn't it in- industrialized internet websites and things. Oh my goodness, mm-hmm. my goodness me. And um, I've never spoken about this before because it's never actually come up. Mm-hmm. Uh, because um, when I've done these things before, it's always been about the kind of, uh, the hard nature of the novel. I'm a woman who writes hard fiction, etc., mm-hmm. etc. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm surprised. I'm surprised it's never come mm-hmm. up before. You're the first person to actually even touch on it. And, and, and it, so I do not pull my punches, because if you're going to be confronted with this, I want you to be confronted with what I think is a little bit of the truth of the situation, and I do not want to glamorise it. Right, but it's not in order to entertain. No. It's in order it's to in pursue order to, your message. And yeah, your, yeah, and, and understand right. my characters you and the lives they need. These blokes in the books to get away with it. No. Oh no! <laughs> so you want you want an e- an ending, you know, yes. somehow. Yes. Yeah. They, no. No. Um, I, I, well, I don't want to give away any yeah. spoilers, but yeah. and and it's not uh, a kind of one of those female fantasies where uh, you know she goes around with a gun and she just kills every rapist right. she can find. Uh, but um, but ultimately, the perpetrators of this violence against women get their comeuppance. I also very much play with William in this as well. Mm-hmm. William's job is effectively exploitative. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you how you, yes. if you thought he was a, a moral yeah. Yeah. man. He's a moral man or not. Yeah, because, it's because is it, does he only have male clients? You said that, that he was trying to take photographs of the yeah. women. Yeah. But he did, never has women who want photographs of their the, husband. The rules for divorcing your husband are different. You had to also prove adultery but also brutality and prove it. Adultery wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. Oh, and that's why the novel's set in 33, because the divorce laws changed about 36 oh. to equalise slightly. But before that, oh, you had God. to prove brutality as well, if you were a woman. Um, so with William, I 
what I wanted Willie to be was a normal bloke. Yeah. I didn't want a hero. Yeah. I wanted yeah. him to be a normal bloke. And a normal bloke who has to actually start to question his relationships with women a little mm. bit. Because I love, oh, this makes me sound really weird. Mm. I love men. Yeah. You know, I'm very happily married. I, you know, I've got a great dad, great grandparents, wonderful father-in-law. You know, my relationships with men have been largely positive. My main hobbies are walking the canals and uh, uh, collecting and restoring antique sewing machines. So I've got a lot of male friends. Mm -hmm. but, um, but good men can be tacitly complicit with poor attitudes towards women. Mm -hmm. Because obviously they've been brought up with it within our culture, which can be exploitative and um, uh, hard towards towards women. Uh, so I wanted William not to be a hero mm -hmm. and to go, you know, um, uh, I would never do this, I would never do that, you know. Yeah. But to be the kind of man who's like, oh, I hadn't thought that mm -hmm. that could happen to mm -hmm. a woman, you know. I hadn't thought that perhaps my attitudes to women were yeah. perhaps harming them. I've had these exact conversations with, with my wife, Jo. Oh, really? Like, yeah, <laughs> where she's, she said, like, you're a good bloke, obviously. I love yes. you. I've married you, so I must think you're a good bloke. But even you are clueless on certain things. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you can try as hard as you want. There are just some things that men will not see. Yeah. Because uh, they're not, you know. Yeah. And I wanted to explore that a bit. And I explored it not because um, I'm kind of a, a man-hater or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to explore it because I actually like men. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see how, you know, what they would do in these circumstances. A good man, a good man in bad circumstances who has to really think about that's what he's done in the past. Mm. It's so much more interesting than just having a, a main character who's flawless and all of yeah. his attitudes are brilliant, all of his yeah. actions are like spot on. That's never met anybody like, like that though, have you? No, no. You know. That's not really a person, is it? It's no, just it's like not a, a person. Like a, an avatar in a video game. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't want that. I wanted, you know, when you start to write a novel, it, it may be your last, and it may never get published. So, you know, you want to do your very best with that first one. Yeah. You know, and the second one. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but I wanted to just make it as realistic and as of me as I could, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to do a... a a quick reading from the book. Yeah, is there Before a particular I, bit or um, the any, beginning? Uh, yeah, the beginning would be great. Um, and then afterwards I'll ask you about the, the writing process and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I won't read too long. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> That's just the first paragraph, the first couple of paragraphs. So Birmingham, Sunday 4th of June 1933. William's footsteps sounded heavy on the bare linoleum. The lighting in the corridor was poor, a single bulb covered by a pink glass shade dangled unlit from the ceiling rose. There was a faint smell of disinfectant and a large vase of silk carnations stood dusty on a console table under a mirror advertising pale ale. The tinny buzz of a wireless played behind closed doors, hummed in the background and pricked at William's nerves. Sweat trickled down his collar in rivulets pooling at the base of his spine, and his camera, prized, weighty, metallic, banged out his jacket pocket and was awkward against his hip. Room 10 was at the end of the hallway and close to the window. William looked outside. Her street was Sabbath quiet. That part of the city was red with Warwickshire clay, the bricks of the buildings warm with it, drapers, bicycle shops, insurance offices, all with Victorian frontages, a touch soiled with soot. An empty tram swayed past, creating clouds of hot dust in its wake. And across the road, modern signage flickered ansels and electric blue on the hard tan tile of the cross keys pub. William glanced at his watch and waited in silence for the minute of the o'clock. This was well planned, all solid and tactical, but the job gave him the wind up always and so his stomach lurched and fell heavy into his bowels as he unlocked the door. The fob swung like a pendulum and he watched it spin until it steadied and then he entered the room. Lace curtains trembled against the open casement window like a bird's wing. The couple were perfectly framed. 
The woman had not been given roses, but gladioli. Their long stems, pink tipped in bud, were strewn across the counterpane. She was wide eyed. Her pretty open mouth formed a per near perfect O. Lipstick smeared acro red across her left cheek, and in the late afternoon light, a halo of dust motes danced above her soft, pale curls. William heard nothing but the perfect click whir of his camera. He wound the film on. On the floor, kneeling in silk knickers, her stockings half masked around dimpled, rounded thighs, the blonde looked towards William and let out a low, guttural moan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I heard one of the. So when women were divorced back in that time, they mm -hmm. lost their children essentially. Didn't yes, they? yes. Which is horrific. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was something that really came across in the novel was, was just moments like that when you could see that that person has realised their entire life is done. Yes. Yeah, and that's a pivotal horrendous. moment really for William. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you got started writing the novel? Did you, yeah. Have you always wanted to um, no. write novels? No, it never occurred to me that I could write a book ever. Um, I was, like I said, I was a massive reader, but I was never one of those children who wanted to write stories. Uh, I was always one of those children who wanted to draw pictures. Ah. Um, so it was never a childhood dream or anything like that. Um, I, I was a very young mum, uh, and my eldest went to university, and I kind of wanted another baby. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to my husband, I said, you have a little boy. And he was like, no way. Yeah. He said, you know, you, we, we're young, we have our babies young. He said, why don't you? Um, <coughs> Oh, did you <laughs> okay. Sorry. He said, uh, you know, we've got, you know, we've got all of our quarters ahead of us. Why don't you go and do something that you really kind of fancy doing? And uh, I absolutely loved my degree, my undergraduate degree. I've got an English degree, English and American studies degree, actually, hence the film all of. But, um, but you know, I was a little bit too scared to go back and do a literature MA. I thought it might be a bit too heavy on the academic theory because I hadn't done it for so long. Uh, and I thought, what's a really great way of exploring my love of books? So I did a creative writing MA. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in an, oh, I don't know what moment of hubris made me do this, but I, I applied to <coughs> the University of East Anglia. So I had my MA from the University of East Anglia's prestigious writing MA. Uh, and uh, it was brilliant, it was life changing. Not because, you know, I got published, because that was a slog. That was a massive <coughs> slog. It was brilliant because I, um, I got to meet reading friends. Yeah. Everybody on there was a massive reader and a lover of books. And it was so nice just to nerd out, yeah. talk about books, talk about our writing, and not feel silly. Yeah. Uh, and I made life lifelong friends on that course, and so that was that was absolutely liberating and life changing. And it also, as a middle aged woman, you know, an early empty nester perhaps, I felt all of a sudden like actually, boom, mm -hmm. you know, my life isn't necessarily downhill from now on. Boom, I, I, I can do something else. I've done something else. So it was absolutely life changing. Um, uh, so, so Needless Alley is a response to the fiction I love. It's an exploration of the fiction I love. In, in matter of fact, it was quite a rigorous course, and I did have to do a, I think it was a 20,000 word literature essay anyway to accompany the novel. Um, and that was, that, was, that, was, that was the Hammett stuff I did. Uh, to talk about your influences and yeah, how you yeah, it's like to be a literary exploration of Hammett's work, but um, but yes, um, it's absolutely life changing that course, and that's why I wrote the book. Yeah, because I had to, because it was a it was a function mm -hmm. of DNA. Right, what a brilliant advert for the MA. <laughs> that your book uh, is now published. You're a yeah, publisher and yeah, that's great. Um, 
yeah, it, it's, it's a remarkable thing to happen and I'm still kind of processing it. Mm -hmm. It's still quite strange to process. Yeah. Did it come with, um, were you in sort of giving feedback to each other? Yes, it was a workshopping oh, okay. situation, Ooh. which toughens you up. <clears throat> yeah, Alison was talking about this when we talked a couple of weeks ago. Because um, I write myself, but I just show it to my wife or my father in law. Oh. And she was like, it's got to get in front of other people. It doesn't count. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're a big, big fan of just giving it to everyone and then. Yeah. Just letting just them have at it. it. Yeah. Letting them have at it. I th okay. I have this theory, which I stole from Angela Carter. So don't, if you really agree with it, don't think it's my clever idea. Mm -hmm. But you, when you read the book, you're rewriting the book. Because what you're doing is you're bringing your own experiences, yeah. your own likes and dislikes, how you're feeling emotionally on that particular day to that text. Yeah. So um, it's really interesting to get your work out there to see how other people write your book. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because what you're necessarily intending to convey is not necessarily what could be conveyed to the That's majority. Right. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, good readers can give you good ideas mm -hmm. as well. Uh, also, there is a kind of weird thing, and if you're writing, you know this, that what you want in your head is difficult to get onto the page, yeah. and workshopping helps so much with that. Mm -hmm. Some writers don't like workshopping, but I really do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do, and some of the people I met in my MA, we get together and we swap each other's work. Yeah. I love that, because I'm not a fan of the, I think Stephen King said it, I love him, but he said that, like, I he was being poetic at the time, but mm -hmm. that reading is, is like psychic communication and the author is just speaking straight to you and, mm -hmm. and that doesn't take into account where you are, what you're doing, where, mm -hmm. you, you, know, where you are in your life. Um, yeah. I did um, some research on The Exorcist, which was oh, fun really? because it was talking about how, talking to people who watched it when they were the age of the girl in the film who yes. was possessed versus when they watched it when they were the age of the parent. That's fascinating. And it's a completely different film, yeah. um, depending on what age you are. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I love that idea yeah. of uh, them rewriting the book. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, I think it's a very intimate <coughs> relationship, actually, between reader and writer. Mm. Uh, and I suppose I come, I come from my writing from a point of view as a reader. I always say I'm a reader. Uh, and, yeah, and, and, and workshopping helps you explore how other readers view your work. Yeah. Do you find writing therapeutic at all? It's can be. Mostly it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can be. There are moments <coughs> where you're like So 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 writing you to Sally was cheaper than therapy. Yeah. And I yeah. got a lot of anger. I got a lot of stuff that was on my blooming plate, mm -hmm. you know, into that into that book. I got it off my chest. Uh, and a lot of things I was interested in. I did a presentation actually on my MA about men, uh, uh, about how I was really fascinated by men, always fascinated by men. So I was, <coughs> not men, no. but male characters. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me sound like a massive pervert, but male characters and yeah. how they're presented. And I, I used to, when I was a teenage girl, I used to read crime fiction to see what men were like. Yeah. Weirdly. Yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that is a kind of uh, uh, an exploration mm -hmm. of these kind of childhood thoughts and feelings I have not only about the genre but about what it is to be a woman mm -hmm. as well and kind of how you figure out men. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so yeah, cheaper than therapy. Yeah, and you don't have to like write an autobiography for it to be Absolutely about not. yourself. You can, no. you can have little bits of yourself creeping. Yeah, in. that's it. Yeah, it's um, just, it's, it's like... There are my imaginary friends, yeah. and I'm just letting them work out some of my stuff for me, mm -hmm. um, in a very extreme way. I live a very, very, very quiet life, mm -hmm. um, but in, a, in a, an extreme way. So it's cheaper than therapy, mm -hmm. but then I sit down and I get stage fright when I write. Mm -hmm. Alison's get, got oh, a brilliant okay. technique for getting over for that. you. Oh really? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, please. <laughs> then I get a horrible stage fright. Oh, I mean, gut churning. Oh, wow. Stage fright when I write. Mm. After a while, it, it eases. Mm. 
And sometimes I, very rarely I hit that sweet spot where I'm like, yeah, this is the sweet, sweet writing moment. But mostly it's, it's a... I just, I just write while telling myself that it's rubbish and I hate myself. And <laughs> that's it, that's it, yeah. <laughs> I hate it and I'm rubbish and I hate myself and why am I doing this? And I should have gone back to teaching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice, the thoughts and feelings. Alison uses improv comedy, don't you? Yeah, you do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, no. Yeah, perhaps I need it. I need something like that just to get myself out of my own exactly. head. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. How did you find um, first starting out? Did you start with smaller pieces or did you jump straight? Went straight. Because that is the first really? thing I've ever written. Oh, I went straight cool. into a novel like a complete yeah. idiot. That's incredible. Oh, it's so unusual. So how did you feel when you were first presenting bits of it to other people? Because it can feel, because it's such a, there's no barrier between you and the person reading it. You know, if you if you make a film, you can be like, oh, my camera was rubbish, my actors did yeah. my actors weren't very good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, my laptop is really old and yeah, rubbish. That's why my writing is really old and rubbish. Yeah. Um, so no, how did it feel to gosh. hand that over? Because it can feel a bit like Daunting. handing over a piece of your soul and being like, what do you think? Like, okay, gotcha. I was alright with it. Yeah? And it's not necessarily because I was very self confident about the work, it's because I wasn't self confident about oh, the work. Oh, okay. Because you were sitting there typing it going, I hate myself. Yeah, yeah because I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so I was alright with it. Um, I felt very nervous about going down to Norwich and mm. becoming part of that kind of community because it was out of my comfort zone. But when the workshopping actually happened, they were all. I was blessed, really, with a good group. In a safe space, right? Very safe space. Mm. And uh, and everybody was really good. Mm. So uh, there's a difference between, as I often say this to my students, I say, you know, it's not necessarily about whether you like it or whether you don't like it. That's absolutely yeah. immaterial. You know, what is the writer trying to do here? What is the writer trying trying to construct here, what mm -hmm. scene is, what's going on with these characters, and is that working? Right. You know, and everybody on my course instinctively knew that, or were more experienced than me, yeah. and just kind of knew how that workshopping worked. So it was actually a very good place to work things through, and very well run as yeah. well by the, the, uh, the lecturers, uh, who were writers themselves, obviously. So that was, that was really uh, worthwhile. Did everybody have the same sort of intent? Like they all wanted to become professional writers? See, I didn't go intending to be, to be a professional writer. Oh, right, okay. No, absolutely not. I was the only one who didn't put my hand up when that question was asked. Mm. Yeah. Because I didn't genuinely thought, oh, oh I'm never going to get published. You were just doing it for I was just like, I was doing it because I, I, I wanted to explore how these things I've loved so much all my life are solace to me, mm -hmm. not reading, absolute solace. How these things that have given me so much joy and pleasure all my life were constructed. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I come from a, a literary criticism background because I'm an English teacher. Mm -hmm. So I know how to analyse a text. Mm -hmm. But when we do that, we don't think about how it's constructed. Yeah. The processes of construction. And we don't think necessarily about how to, cr to create a paragraph, scene, chapter, novel. These these larger constructions. Uh, we we look for themes. We look for narrative point of view. You know, we look for particularly use of language, but we don't look at construction. Yeah. And I thought, wonder, I wonder how that's done. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I, I don't know how that's done unless I try and do it myself. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I went there because I thought mm -hmm. this would be. A, this would be a way of doing it. And I might be the only one who ever did that. Um, so so when the kind of tough part of sending it out to agents and editors and things came, I was pretty sanguine. Mm -hmm. Because it had never been my dream. Right. So when it was really tough, yeah. like, you know, really tough. Right. And it is tough. Uh, if you're going to try it, it is tough. I was, I was okay with it. Mm -hmm. Because I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve, which was get it written, mm. get it edited, see see how it's done. Yeah. Did that did your background in um, literary analysis make it harder for you? Because, you know, as a as a former film student I know how often academics you will read yes. Yeah, they'll read into things that you know, like, you know, yeah. Alien is all about 
various bodily parts. And, um, no, you know, I that... think I think I enjoyed it because of that. Yeah. Because there, there are Easter eggs in here that only anybody who's really into Hamlet will know, or <laughs> really into Chandler will know. Yeah. That's a, some sort of like really hardcore analysis of text. Yeah. It's kind of fallen into there. And also, if you're a fan of T. S. Eliot as well, there's stuff in there. But you know, you don't have to be a fan of T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland yeah. to, right. to 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 enjoy New Sally. But I was like, ha ha ha, I'm going to put some Wasteland references <laughs> in because that's the background I came from. But so it gave you like an extra tool set to play with, rather than yeah, that was part of the fun. You it weren't was... writing it, being like, oh, a student's going to read this. Oh uh, yeah, so I never ever thought that anybody <clears throat> would do close analysis of text on New Sally. <laughs> I never thought. I never had that consciously in my back, you know, in my, yeah. that was not in my thought process at all. My thought process was, ah, yeah, oh, yeah, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, right. let's pop a bit of that in there, and, yeah. and all of the references that I love, from like the, the genre fiction that I love. Yeah. Did the book change much from when you, um, so I presume you, you yes. got yourself an agent first and then went to the publisher? Yeah, it massively changed. Through yeah. the agent? Oh um, gosh, it's a, it's a kind of convoluted process. So as a as a script, an MA script, it did its it was it it did well. Mm. But it had uh, I did that very academic thing where I uh, really reflected the genre I love. And if you if you know your Chandler or you know your Hammett, those guys wrote for magazines. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. mm -hmm. So uh, they wrote for a magazine called Black Mask primarily. So it was a weekly episodic story, yeah. and and so there was no overarching plot. Right. So Chandler said, if in doubt, get a man to come in and pull a gun out. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so the their plots are very uh, loose, uh -huh. right. particularly Chandler. Sort of meandering. Oh yeah, uh, picaresque, episodic, uh -huh. and Nita Sally was very picaresque. You know, poor old William was just battered from one point okay. to the next to the next right. to the next. And um, in, in, in writer's parlance, I pantsed it. Right, um, okay. Which was really you pantsed great. it? That's, I did, absolutely. Because it's so it. well plotted and so. The, the uh, crew oh, <clears throat> first draft. <laughs> <laughs> so I pantsed and completely pantsed the first draft, which is a great way of getting to know character and setting. Yeah. And then um, at the UEA, because it's uh, editors and agents, they come <coughs> kind of and have like dues. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of. Uh, have to have like cocktail parties with warm white wine and things and chat with you know ladies with pashminas uh, and I felt uh, I, I, you know when in the end of Morecambe and Wise where Eric Morecambe has got his Mac and his carrier bags mm -hmm. I, I actually literally had a carrier bag in one of these dudes mm -hmm. I thought and I was sort of standing in the corner like <gasps> with a carrier bag and like people were not interested in the novel at mm -hmm. all you know, you could tell which novels had buzz about them, but Nita Sally wasn't one of them. Uh, but then we had to, we sent off uh, early chapters to agents and stuff, and I was approached by uh, an agent on, on the back of that. Oh gosh, I mean, one of my favorite contemporary writers that this agent represented. And uh, oh, she was really nice to me, really nice. And she had to write what, what they call a full manuscript, which is the whole of your novel. So if you read the first few chapters, if she likes it, she'll be nice to you and ask for the full. And she completely ghosted me. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Now, that told me something. It told me, A, I could write well enough for her to be interested in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> and B, it wasn't up to scratch. Right. So I bought something called Save the Cat, screenwriter's yes. book. Yes. And I thought, if Nita Sally was going to be turned into a screenplay, how would I go about doing that? Right. So I thought, like, mm. let's see what those boys do. And they yeah. are boys, mostly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what will those guys do? Uh, this is, um, for those who haven't read it, it's, it's like a template. Yes. Or yeah. it basically takes lots of the most successful Hollywood films and says, what makes them work? And mm. yes. he basically finds that they all have certain beats that yes. they always hit. Points of action. Yeah. And there are certain points of action in a, in a <coughs> strong genre narrative. And the save the cat is, if, to make your hero likeable, have them do something nice in the first five minutes, whether it's saving right. a cat from a, mm -hmm. being run over by the car, or just yeah. tipping a waitress. It's just like a tiny little thing that all successful Hollywood films do to get you on side with the yeah. main character. So no matter how um, dodgy William's business is, 
he paid for Clara's um, tea in the lion's tea rooms. Mm. So, so you're like, whatever he does, oh, he's not that bad. Guy. Yeah, so I worked it's with it's those beats, which sounds really, really cheesy. And, and Nida Sally's still a, a literary, the, the literary end of crime, very much so. But it taught me no end, mm -hmm. no end about what mm. readers and uh, consumers of genre fiction want from a novel and not to stray too much from those big, really big important structures actually so i rewrote it yeah in lockdown oh right so like i said i don't just kill my darlings <laughs> i just batter them to death there's whole chapters not just scenes beautifully written precise chapters that have been workshop to death right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um, would you recommend that as well because there's a lot of <clears throat> Like understandable criticism of things like Save the Cat and, and yeah. these, this template format yeah. of being like if you if you just try and hit all that yeah. it can be formulaic. Mm. So would you recommend just writing it first and getting it out and then using that as like a, a pencil sharpener to kind of? I think it's a pencil sharpener because it, as much as I use Save the Cat and and I'm I, I'm using Save the Cat right now actually because I've done exactly the same thing with my first draft of. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, as much as I use Save the Cat, it's, it's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool, it's not a Bible. So you use it to sharpen your story. Because these things, um, so you know, it's, it's narratology, isn't it? Mm. So, uh, so there's this, this academic theory, and it's a film theory as well as a literary theory, that there's only a few stories in the entire world. And that's because we as human beings look for patterns, and we look for patterns of behaviours. We also look for archetypes, the mother, the hero. Um, yeah, the Joseph Campbell thing. That's it, yeah, the, hero, yeah, the hero of hypnosis and the archetypes. So as human beings, we look for set patterns in our stories, because life is so chaotic, we want pattern mm -hmm. and order in our stories. And I think Save the Cat, or any other book that suits your process mm -hmm. and helps you get through, uh, construct a, a, a narrative, uh, it's very helpful. I just used Save the Cat because I thought screenwriters know their stuff when mm. it comes to narrative. So you don't really need to help as, as much on the, um, <clears throat> on the what goes in a sentence part. No. Because I, I find that's not easier, but the, it's easier to fix. So yes. if you've got a paragraph that's bad, that you can fix that in, a, in an afternoon. If you've got a, a story structure that is well off, yeah, you that need the pandemic. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and and oftentimes I think certain writers have a natural ability, and and um, structure is not my natural ability. Mm -hmm. It might be that I, I can co I construct a good scene, mm -hmm. but that overarching massive um, structure of a, a a novel is not something I naturally. I'm yes. too much of a kind of butterfly. Oh, I'm going to take William to the cathedral because the, 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 the stained glass is lovely. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, so I'm too much of a butterfly. Right. So I have to rein myself in and be very, very aware of what my natural strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you've started book two oh, already? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be with my editor in about a, a month's time. Oh, right. Yeah. How do you um, get to the point where, because you're obviously a big lover of research mm. and knowing your stuff before mm. you jump in mm. um, one of the things I always struggle is with is um, I will research for years and years and years and not actually write anything um, <laughs> Just that's the pleasure yeah so <laughs> how do you get to the point where you're you're like I know enough now to be able to write this story and I can just I'm okay now I don't need to yeah. go to any places I don't need to read any more books mm. I can just jump in tell the story and it should be all right it it happened strangely, I think. So um, I was thinking of the Red Hollow about third boy in to Nida Sally's second draft. So you know you were talking about the bit in Battersea Clinton where he's buried yeah. standing up. I thought, I, I just need to take my boy out to the city for a bit. Mm -hmm. right. And that's where the kind of... And I so enjoyed writing that countryside chapter where mm -hmm. he's out, out near Knoll. The, in the original script, uh, manuscript, uh, each chapter was a place in Birmingham or Warwickshire or Worcestershire. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. 
So I named each chapter after like a street or a town or whatever. Uh, uh, but I, I really enjoyed writing that countryside stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where the second novel permeates is. And yeah. of course, uh, you, you'll notice yourself when you've got an idea for the second when you're writing the first. Yeah. You're like, oh, I really, really want to write the countryside it's a, one. It's a killer, isn't it? Yeah. Awesome. So I kind of was doing, it was permeating. And then I kind of looked at uh, the history of houses in the area, great houses in the, yeah. in the area, the geography of the area and stuff that I wanted to look at. Uh, and that came way before I even pitched it to uh, my editor. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that work was done even before I came up with the story. Well, you take lots of um, notes and things that I've seen different. Stephen King says, if it's a good idea, it'll stick around. If it's a bad idea, I'll forget it. So he doesn't write anything down. Oh, but like yeah. Chuck Palahniuk will, will have him like he writes his novels in notebooks that he carries around with him on the train. So yes. His latest draft is always on the train with him yeah. in a notebook. Yeah. That might be terrifying. Yeah. Um, <coughs> where do you fall? Yeah, and Agatha Christie had scrapbooks, didn't she? Oh, yeah. She did, yeah. Scrapbooks full oh, of um, newspaper. newspaper articles. She that took a fancy. Uh, I'm a bit of both, really. So I, I've actually got it with me. Um, I can find it on the train. <laughs> so, notebook full of. No, it's some rubbish, really. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so that, and I have one per book. Um, one notebook. Yeah, per book. yeah. So that's my that's my red hollow <coughs> notebook. Um, nice. But also, uh, I've got a lot on my phone. Yeah. You have notes right. on your phone. Yeah. I do audio notes also. I like yeah. I just so talking over it. Oftentimes, I'm having a bath. I've had a really bad day writing, and I'm, I've got the bath salts in, and then all of a sudden, yeah. It comes, I'm like, whoa! And I, so I have to have my phone. When you're relaxed, yeah, right? By, by the side of the bath, mm -hmm. just in case I come up with something like a, mm -hmm. a solution. Uh, but then again, uh, I'm not an organized person. Oh, gosh, I wish I was. Yeah. So I'd love to have, like, if somebody, if you said to me, oh, where are the notebooks for Nigga Sally? I'd be like, yeah, right. mm, not sure. Because, you know, I'm done with them. So let's hope I'm never famous because there's nobody, because <laughs> <laughs> there'll be no archive. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a bit of both. It's good to know though that you're not that organised because oh, it really? can seem from the outside that professional writers all have everything together and they've got binders and you know oh, no. index cards and all that. Yeah. But it's nice. I'm that absolute just rubbish. On your phone as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Rubbish. Have you sold many books? Uh, gosh, have I sold many books? <laughs> I think I'm selling okay. I um, there's some nice things have happened. So I was well reviewed in some good newspapers. You had great reviews, yeah, I've seen. Yeah, That's and, right. and they tell you every six months, right? Yeah, they yeah. Always, so yeah, you don't know right you away. You don't know right yeah. away. Um, uh, so I've been well reviewed, um, <laughs> and I'm. Uh, it's been named as one of the books of summer, for the Financial Times book of summer thing. Uh, so that great, was good. Great. And I'm also um, doing something called Nublas at Harrogate, which is a big crime festival yeah. up north. And Nublas is um, where four crime writers are chosen, debut crime writers are chosen to speak with Val McDermott. Oh, wow. The great, great Val McDermott. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Whether it's selling, I mean, it's not in the Times bestseller list or anything like yeah. that. Um, but, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm pretty sanguine about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, if you overthink it, you can get terribly stressed about it. But this is this is a really you know when you have a baby and they nobody tells you that you're probably gonna need an episiotomy? You know, you it's gonna be pretty bad. They should have told you. <laughs> you know, that's what a debut author is like. Nobody tells you about the good stuff and you dare to tell any other authors yes. that some bad stuff might happen. It could be quite stressy. Yeah. But ultimately you've got a baby. Right. You know what I mean? It yeah. could be quite a stressy won. experience, but yeah. you know, so if, if I'm dropped, I, this is my baby. Yeah. You know, it happened and I did it. Yeah. If nobody reads it or everybody hates it, you know, yeah. I've got an ugly baby. <laughs> 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 but nonetheless, I, this is my baby. So, um, so is it selling? It's doing really well critically. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Uh, and I'm over the moon with that. It might mean that I'm a writer's writer. I don't know. Do you know mm, what I mean? Yeah. It might mean that. But ultimately, you know, it's nice. And this and this is nice as well because it means, again, I get to chat with readers. Right. And that's what I wanted. And I'll just bring back what we were talking about before we started. Um, when you take out library books, authors get royalties. That's right. 
I so, sure do. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So never feel guilty for taking me to sell it. Take it out 10, 15, 20 yeah. times. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Right, we'll wrap it up if that's okay. No, Thank you so much. Um, no, we have been lovely copies to speak of, with people. Thank you. We have copies of the book available. It's yeah. not on the library catalogue, so you can't take it out from the library. So <laughs> if you want to read it, you should. Um, we do have to run them through the uh, through the till downstairs, okay. but we can, um, if you'd like to get them signed, we can then take them downstairs and then sort all that end up yeah. afterwards. But thank you very much. Christine. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you for all the brilliant questions. Does anybody have any extra questions? Really at all? great. Oh, I want a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want books. Thank you.